We are back, and we are joined now by Guillaume Long, former foreign minister of Ecuador, senior research fellow at the Center for Economic and Policy Research, author of his recent piece in foreign policy entitled How a Startup Utopia Became a Nightmare for Honduras. Uh, Guillaume, thanks so much for coming on the show today. No, thank you very much for having me on the show. It's a pleasure. It, it, uh, likewise. Um, before we talk about the specifics of your piece and just, you know, how seriously dire these kind of like economic development zones are and the what it's creating in Honduras. Um, can we talk about the state of Honduran politics starting with the coup in 2009 um, and how we got to this particular point? Sure. I mean, the 2009 Honduran coup was a pretty standard Latin American military style coup. I, I mean, I say this because a lot that, you know, there have been more subtle coups since the 1960s and 70s. Uh, and a lot of coups have become sort of more juridical coups, uh, sort of semi impeachment processes that are sometimes look like coups. Uh, this is not the case. This is a classical uh, military coup uh, in which the uh, Honduran president back then, Mel Celaya, was sort of, uh, you know, whisked away in the middle of the night in his pajamas, actually, uh, via a base with uh, military, with U.S. military presence, in fact, uh, and taken out of the country and then replaced in what was, you know, a violent process, which was followed by violent repression of protesters. It was an old-fashioned violent military coup. I mean, then you had civilian leaders, so it was kind of whitewashed through this. Um, but it was a coup recognized as such by the international community, um, certainly by the different regional bodies in Latin America. Even the, the Obama administration kind of called it a coup and then eventually enabled uh, sort of a, a whitewashing of the coup, you know, enabled the transition right. uh, after 2009. So it was a, a brutal process and it was followed by, you know, 12 years of very authoritarian uh, government. Um, several administrations, one in particular, the Juan Orlando Hernandez administration was particularly brutal, authoritarian and corrupt. And, uh, you know, Juan Orlando Hernandez, the latest president, uh, is now sitting in a U.S. jail facing uh, narco trafficking charges. So there was, a, you know, U, the U.S. woke up to the fact that this was both authoritarian and corrupt quite late later on in the day, but eventually there was uh, sort of an awakening and uh, coming to terms with the fact that this was a problematic regime. And so the latest uh, coup president, because there's a series of coup presidents, mm -hmm. is now sitting in a US in a US jail. So very, very, very sad times for Honduras and with a deep um, political consequences because of the authoritarianism, institutional consequences because of the corruption, and also social and economic consequences. This is the heyday of the rise of violence in Honduras. It's also uh, a moment of great um, growth of poverty and inequality. And of course, and this is a special interest of the United States and concern in, in even in US domestic politics, this is the time of a great wave of migration right. from uh, Honduras and generally speaking the Northern Triangle, but in particular Honduras to uh, the United States with a peak peak in 2021, just before the new government uh, was uh, sworn in. So, yeah, sad times for Honduras to 12 years after the 2009 coup. Yeah, it, it is um, it, it, it is something that we in uh, American politics, politics mostly don't reckon with the fact that coups or destabilization that we support in Latin America results in migration. I mean, it, like the, the influx of Venezuelan migrants amidst our uh, crushing sanctions on that country is a big part of, of why we see some of these migrants coming over. Um, but putting that aside for, for a second, uh, that, that corruption that you talk about, that deep corruption after the coup in 2009, um, really resulted in what what your your piece centers around the development of these basically economic development zones. Um, you know, we have versions of that here in the U.S. Opportunity zones and tax breaks that go to corporations to invest in this. And and we covered this under the Trump administration how you know it was very glad handy and also not necessarily providing the. Uh, the, the, the community investment that it purported to, that is like peanuts compared to the level of devastation that these zones uh, created in Honduras um, through these corrupt leaders. 
talk a bit about these zones. They're called ZEDEs, um, I believe. I, I'm not sure if it, you, I'm pronouncing it right, but um, what are they? How did they come to be? And how do they fit into the, the current political situation in Honduras? Yeah, so the ZEDEs, which uh, you, we usually use the sort of term in Spanish, Z is, yes. um, but they're basically, as you said, you know, special economic zones. Um, and they're, you're right, there's a long history of this. Uh, actually, going back, you know, you can go way back. You can go back to how the Brits used to administer their empire with the East Asia Company. Uh, mm. You know, they're like not not having direct uh state control but having essentially corporations or boards of corporations private entities running territories as if that territory was their own private state right so uh you you know there's there's been lots of examples uh, some uh special economic zones have had varying degrees of success um, you know, if you look at the history of China, uh, the, the famous one is Shenzhen there, which the Chinese were able to sort of create this kind of free trade zone uh, on, their, on, on their coast and through that to get some uh, investment and then to sort of use that as a, a launching pin for the rest of the, for the modernization of their economy. So, you know, there are some cases that are sometimes heralded as success stories to justify all the others. I think the success stories are few and far between. And the success stories are always accompanied by a strong state sort of looking at what's going on there and then, you know, sort of either taking, eventually taking control or replic replicating certain practices or, but not the Honduras, this is not the case of Honduras, right? The Honduras case is one of the most extreme cases of privatization of space. So not just a tax free zone, but an area in which corporations basically have absolute autonomy uh, so much so that they have their own courts they have their own security services they have basically their own sovereignty over uh, a chunk of territory which the honduran state then you know cannot sort of meddle in or exert any type of sovereignty in um, and you know i think most scholars who study these uh, free ports uh, free trade zones that have different names around the world sort of recognize that the, the honduran zede is the most you know fundamentalist uh, expression of this wow. uh, now how did it come about what well, it came about exactly because of the level of corruption that was uh, you know uh, tolerated and i would say encouraged by some large corporations uh, after the coup so uh, after the coup, a number of corporations approached the Honduran state, um, and there are some negotiations in order to create this, these ZEDs. Um, the first attempt is barred by the Honduran Constitutional Court, which says, wait a minute, this is taking away you know, territory from uh, Honduran jurisdiction. This is unconstitutional. We cannot have that. So eventually, uh, one of the coup governments gets rid of the constitutional court, which stands in the way, and replaces the constitutional court by another constitutional court with all sorts of judges that are friendly to this uh, process of privatizing Honduran land and giving away to these corporations, the Zedes. So you can see here that these corporations have been accompanying the process uh, all along, you know, for over a period of 10 years, until finally they get these Zedes uh, passed and they get given this piece of land to sort of play with and, and, and create their own, you know, the word charter city is often used, hmm. uh, a city which they can basically run. Um, and a lot of these investors are, are sort of Silicon Valley libertarians. I mean, this is kind of a little bit of a simplification, but I think it really embodies yep. the, you know, the kind of investors that you're seeing uh, who have this kind of dream of, um, charter cities, startup cities, are often words words that are also used, in which you know they're not they're not going to be hampered by state or regulations or taxes or anything like that, and they're basically going to be able to um, run these private cities uh, for the benefit of their of their investors, of course, but with it with a certain utopia in mind, right? The idea is to really show the world that the state is the problem and that if you have these shining cities that are run by these corporations, uh, you know, it's going to create wealth. And, and there, there are a few other cities like that. I mean, a few Bitcoin cities as well in El Salvador. And in right. Australia. So it's part of that family. And um, it is... Um, 
is what happened in Honduras. I mean, three such places, three such Zedes were created. Uh, the biggest one and the most powerful one by far created on Honduras's largest Caribbean island, an island called Roatan, which is a very uh, idyllic Caribbean island uh, where lots of there's lots of tourism, basically for scuba diving purposes. Uh, and the idea is to give a large chunk of this beautiful, pristine island to these investors so that they then can build these this shining modern city uh, to do all sorts of um, economic activities, including some stuff which usually is heavily regulated, including in the United States, um, you know, in, uh, in, uh, in the field of genetics, in the field of bioscience, where there's qu quite a lot of regulation. So there's some suspicion there as well that, you know, uh, this is a way of doing uh, things without much bioethics uh, involved and without much... That's uh, so creepy. I mean, I like... It really is this libertarian, you know, vision that you describe um, and one that, you know, unfortunately we are seeing in El Salvador. But but this is just carving up Honduras to give to like U.S. investors and capitalists, regardless of the, the displacement that it creates or regardless of like the scarcity of resources that it engenders when you just decide to give away parts of your country to rich guys so they can do their little weird experiments. Um, and there's really, based on your your piece, I, shockingly, not shockingly, I guess when you realize who's writing the, these laws and stuff, but, but there's very few mechanisms for recourse, for challenging them in any meaningful way. Can you talk a little bit about that impact? Yeah, I mean, in Honduran law, basically... I mean, it means the state of Honduras does not have a say on a aspect of its on on a on a on a key part of its territory, right? It's basically right. a complete loss of sovereignty on behalf of the Honduran state. Uh, it almost amounts to saying that this chunk of territory isn't Honduras anymore, right? I mean, this is it's pretty serious. I mean, there's a real sort of colonial dimension or neo-colonial dimension yep. to this. Right? Um, and so it's unsurprising that, you know, uh, various, well, first, several Honduran institutions, I mean, I just mentioned the uh, constitutional court said, no, this is not okay. And then they were sort of pushed out. And then you've had uh, a lot of civil society organizations. Um, there was various civil society organizations, in fact, came together, including the indigenous movement. I mean, that the, the region where this, the largest Z is being um, constructed is in the Caribbean, so mostly uh, sort of um, Afro-Caribbean organizations as well, getting involved to protest this. Um, and, you know, uh, typically also, uh, and arrogantly, the uh, corporation arriving on the land that it's been adjudicated, it's been basically given to create this new state, and then also starting to have a uh, conflictive relationship with the local inhabitants, right? Um, you know, local inhabitants first being told uh, there's going to be a big um, sort of touristic resort built on their land, uh, and then little by little they realize that the land, you know, the land's being gated, the land's being privatized, social services are now uh, being privatized. There was a big problem with access to water. Uh, you know, so starting very soon, you see uh, the the, the Z is starting to have real, you know, tangible impacts on uh, local inhabitants and local inhabitants fighting back, protesting, and, you know, this, 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 this coming to, I mean, basically, um, people saying, no, we don't want to be, we want, we're Hondurans, we want, don't want to be part of this uh, crazy uh, right. or dystopian uh, process. Yeah, utopian for, for the, the capitalists there, but like, the yeah, I mean, the, the what's also interesting to me too is that the current president the first female president ever of honduras castro is um ran in opposition to these so it's become quite politically salient within honduras and has um as a kind of a center leftist vowed to to take them on and um it seems as though there there is like a an international kind of court system, the ICSID that you write about, I believe, where 
there's arbitration and potential for some sort of recourse. And even the United States, like Elizabeth Warren, um, has spoken out in opposition to these kinds of um, zones and, and Zetas in this instance. What is the status of Honduras's efforts under this new president, fairly new president, to uh, to, to to push back against this? So you're absolutely right. I mean, the current president who sworn in in 2022, the first female president of Honduras on a uh, um, broadly sort of left of center platform, um, campaigned in 2021 against these Zedis. I mean, the 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 no to the Zedis, uh, literally, that was the slogan, was featured quite prominently in her campaign, right? So when she arrived in power, she said, okay, now we're going to dismantle the, these Zedis. First of all, they were unconstitutional and corrupt and all these things we just discussed. And, I, and, and secondly, this was a key message in my campaign and therefore people have voted for this and we're going to, uh, you know, dismantle, dismantle this. And surprise, surprisingly, uh, Congress voted unanimously in favor of repealing the Zedis law. Even mm. opposition parties, you know, some of them had actually been in favor of the Zedis, I think started coming to terms that this was unacceptable, that the Honduran electorate had voted massively against this, that this was extremely unpopular. And in her, let's say, early months in power, in the honeymoon period, she got this unanimous parliamentary vote against the Zedis and repealed the law. But the investors have said, what you've just uh, 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 presented. And they've said, um, ah, but uh, we have, we are going to take you to court now to this thing called ICSID, which is an international investment state dispute settlement mechanisms, of uh, which there are many in the world. This is quite techy, but it's, I think it's good for your audience to understand very broadly speaking what it means. These are arbitration mechanisms when a state and a corporation have a dispute. So when states and investors have disputes, uh, there are treaties that are signed between, between states that these disputes are not settled in the courts of the countries where the investment happens. This was, on one of the, this was one of the big things of the sort of neoliberal heyday of the 80s and 90s, I would say, of the Washington consensus. We often talk a lot about, you know, the privatization, the rolling back the state, you know, the, the putting an end to uh, the, the, the large state. But one of the things, and free trade agreements and all these things, people, I think, and deregulation, people understand this. But what sometimes people don't understand, this came hand in hand with investment state dispute settlement mechanism, what is often called in it's very jargony, but it's called ISDS, right? Investment State Dispute Settlement Mechanism. And these are basically treaties that were signed particularly between states, developing countries in the global south and countries like the United States or European, but also the Chinese and so on. And the idea was, you know, you, you will get US investment, but first you sign this treaty here so that if there is a problem, then we don't go to your courts in Honduras or we don't go to your courts in Guatemala. We'll go to an arbitration court. And these arbitration courts, of course, are in Paris and London and Washington. This one in particular, ICSID, is attached to the World Bank and it is therefore in Washington, D.C. Now, these arbitration mechanisms are terrible, you know, because it's, the, first of all, the state cannot win. And the state cannot take the investor to court. It's always the investor that takes the state to court. I mean, if the state wins, if you like, it's because he hasn't lost. But, you know, so, you know, in 35% of the cases that are taken to arbitration, the state doesn't actually lose. But in 65% of the cases, the investor wins. And the investor often wins very big. So in this case against Honduras, the investor's claiming, ah, Honduras is in breach of its investment treaties uh, because, uh, you know, uh, we signed these treaties, uh, the United States signed these treaties. Um, so there are several of them, but in, they're appealing to one of, that right. is in chapter, the Central American Free Trade Agreement. Uh, and uh, by closing down the CEDES and by, um, you know, put re repealing the CEDES law, uh, Honduras in, is in breach of that. Therefore, Honduras has to pay the company in Roatan, the CEDES, a 10.7 billion in compensation. Now, 10.7 billion in compensation is a third of Honduran GDP. Now, Honduras, G Honduran GDP is around 29 billion. It's also two thirds of Honduras' state budget, right? So these are huge amounts, which would clearly make Honduras bankrupt. 
based on these treaties that have been signed. Now, uh, you know, we'll have to see how the court, how the arbitration case go, you know, uh, goes, how, how it goes. For, it's quite likely that the judges think that this is outrageous. And well, let me, let me ask, let me ask this then, because I mean, how can they make that determination based on the fact that, I, I mean, like, I guess a letter, if looking at the contract, right, you know, the, 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 technically they do maybe owe this corporation money but it was written under corrupt pretenses literally these presidents who wrote these laws like one of them sitting in a jail right now so why does that not play into the contractual dispute in an arbitration yeah the problem is that these arbitration courts tribunals what this one you mentioned, ICSID, which is attached to the World Bank, and not really run by judges, right? It's not people, they're not lawyers. Or rather, they are lawyers, but they're corporate lawyers. Right. So they're kind of private courts. And, you know, with a strong culture of benefiting investment, because investment is the sort of the deity of, the, of these arbitration courts, right? So investors are the good guys, the states are the evil predators who are trying to put, you know, nationalize investment. And all. So there's a strong cultural prejudice there, which is why, you know, these, it's, it's rare that a state wins. It's, I mean, they never win economically. Sometimes they do not lose, as I've just explained, but it usually goes, uh, you know, it usually favors investors. So this is the great fear. Now, that's one of the problems. The other scandalous problem, uh, I think, is that uh, a lot of these court cases or arbitration cases are based on the loss of future profits. So actually, if you go to the Zede itself on the island of Roatan, there's nothing. I mean, yeah, the, 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 the company that's running the Zede has built three, four buildings there. They've started building, you know, they've, they've, but it's mostly gated area which is yet to be developed. So what they're taking Honduras to court for, for almost $11 billion, is loss of future profits. Future profits, right. Yeah, which is yeah, incredible. I, you know, it's, it's incredible. Yeah. So, so I think this is a particular egregious case of ISDS. ISDS is resisted, by the way, all over the world right now. Um, the Europeans are departing the Energy Charter Treaty en masse. Uh, why? Because... Uh, you know, it, the Energy Charter Treaty, which, is ha which has these arbitration mechanisms, is basically preventing European states from doing the energy transition, you know, from moving away from fossil fuel. Why? Because same problem, right? Loss of future so, profits. Yeah. Well, you, or you close down a coal mine for, you know, for environmental purposes, and then the coal investors take you to court because, you know, there's a there's an investment treaty here, right? So, so a lot of European countries saying, "Oh, this is taking this a bit far." Where they're moving away from the Energy tra Charter Treaty, you had both the Trump and the Biden administration in the United States also saying mm, some of these arbitration courts are too strong. So you're seeing the the advanced economies moving away, but of course, as usual, they're applying this kind of you know, do as I say, not what as I do uh, policies and double standards. And so you're still seeing a number of kind of wealthy countries kind of bullying uh, developing countries saying, if you want investment, investment from my country, from my capitalists in your country, then you have to sign this, these right. arbitration clause here. So, well, so I going just, back I to just, what you were saying about yeah, yeah. This is where the debate is at in Washington. Some people are saying, wait a minute, we're saying we don't want this anymore because it's preventing the energy transition. It's, it's preventing the fight against climate change. But then we're opposing, imposing this on countries such as Honduras, uh, which is, you know, which is where the battle's at right now. In, in exactly. And just to give people a sense like this, this actually is a market shift in thinking in Washington. Thankfully, the TPP failed, but it had similar tribunal <laughs> framework for, for, for corporations that would, that would be able to supersede the sovereignty of other countries if losses were to be incurred by that corporation. I mean, that was one of the more controversial Trans-Pacific Partnership elements as well that, um, you know, why Obama got a ton of criticism for it, as he should have, right? And, and um and, and and now there is a, at least a small, I think, shift in the thinking because like it's like whoa, 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 we have we have handed way too much power to these capitalists, and the fact that they're superseding national sovereignty um, now that it's coming back to bite maybe bigger players in Europe and white people in the ass, then now we have a problem with it essentially. Yeah, I think that's absolutely right. I mean. Yeah. 
it started actually it was the global south that did start it so I, we should you know give them credit the south africans were the first then india then indonesia then ecuador then venezuela several countries in the global south start saying well we're leaving our so what there are various mechanisms but the most common ones are bilateral investment treaties so treaties between two countries that agree that if there's investment we won't go to the courts of either country we'll go to these arbitration courts so a number of countries doing that but then you're right it did start you, you, the EU was a big one, right? Because right. incredibly, the EU is still today the most regulated space on earth, right? So it's still the, the place in on the world where you have the most amount of labor regulations and environmental regulations and so on and so forth, right? So incredibly, you, you started having cases of EU states being taken to court in Washington, D.C., in ICSID, this World Bank Tribunal, by investors um, so there was a fair, famous case with Bulgaria, an EU country, being taken to court in Washington simply for upholding European law, right? Uh, you know, the European labor law, European environmental law. But because there was a bilateral investment treaty with the United States, the investors was able to say, I don't care whether there's a law. It's not my problem. My problem is you've changed the conditions of the contract. Uh, and that is unacceptable. <laughs> So that created a, a backlash in the EU. Um, um, the previous, one of the previous EU uh, presidents of the, the Commission, Juncker, started saying, "Well, this is not right. This is going against the EU." And you know, and 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 we we are at a place. We are in a stage uh, now where there are a number of sort of almost right wing politicians that are saying this is not great. But you, but you know, it's easier for them to. You know, it's often the case that they defend that for their own countries, so for EU countries, but you still see a number of EU presidents, prime ministers, foreign ministers visiting, uh, you know, uh, African states, and I just wrote another piece on this actually, uh, saying, okay, we're leaving the Energy Charter Treaty because we can't uh, tackle climate change by being members, but you should you should definitely sign the uh, Energy Charter Treaty because otherwise our investors are not going to be protected and you're not going to get investment. So you do get these huge double standards in ISDS still with a lot of uh, countries from the global south sort of signing ISDS treaties because they're so desperate for foreign investment, basically. Well, um, this is a fascinating topic and one that, you know, uh, needs more coverage. So I would encourage everybody to read the full piece in Foreign Policy entitled How a Startup Utopia Became a Nightmare for Honduras. We will put a link to it wherever folks are listening or watching this and at majority.fm. Uh, Guillaume, thanks so much for your time today. Really appreciate it. My pleasure. Thank you very much.